and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple. Coming to us straight, coming to us straight from the the world of Mal, the world of Mal High, and probably sick of hearing about Broncos, <laughs> and the the creator of here, the Universal RPG system Heroes and Hardships, which we'll be getting into tonight, the Earl of Fife himself, Mister Jason Duff. No Simpsons jokes, please. How you doing today, man? Good. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Thanks for coming on. So. I'd like to start with the hum- with the humble beginnings. Sure. Um, walk me through your first introduction to role playing games and what made it stick. Oh my goodness! Um, so I'm a mid forties dude, and um, I guess back in the day, uh, before I even knew like something like an organized role playing game existed, I remember. Uh, after I read the Lord of the Rings for the first time, probably uh, a friend of mine and I would kind of just make up stories back and forth. They almost were kind of like choose your own adventures, but just like at face to face, you know, what would you do if this happened or that happened? And then we found AD and D, played that for a while, played GURPS for a while, um, and then. Uh, did some uh, play-by-post stuff where, uh, or really, before that we did um, what's called a mush. So this is a multi, multi-user multi role-playing uh, game. Mm-hmm. Um, we did a few of those. They're similar to MUDs, only just not, MUDs are more just like fighting stuff. So it was like a text-based role-playing. We did that, and, mm-hmm. then, uh, and then when, you know, I, I went to graduate college, we did uh, stuff... Um, play by post stuff, and I started getting into D and D again, uh, and um, other other uh, systems, and I uh, kind of got sick of D and D. Started branching out and playing everything I possibly could that wasn't D and D. And this mm-hmm. is right. This is the three point five days, um, right when Pathfinder was coming out too. And uh, here we are. Just kept at, kept at it, uh, and uh, yeah. Now. One of the th- one of the things that drew that really drew my attention with Heroes and Hardships is it being a universal game that is using the roll and keep system, mm-hmm. which, of course, for a lot of for those for those who know about it, it's going to be popularized by Legend of the Five Rings and Seventh Sea. And if they yep. if they really want to go down the rabbit hole, the ins- the glorious insanity that is Dungeons the Dragoning. I'm not, I'm not familiar with that, but that, yeah, it's it's definitely kind of based on L5R and mm-hmm. 7C. There's there's definitely a which did a you, similarity there. So, which uh, of those of those two games, which did you, which um introduced you to roll and keep first? Uh, L5R. Um, I played L5R second edition through fourth edition. Uh, mm-hmm. Fourth edition is probably my favorite game of all time uh, mm-hmm. to play. Uh, I I really enjoy it, um, and yeah, I'm a, I'm a big L5R fan in general. So that's kind of where where it came from for sure. Um, definitely inspiration for it. It so besides the roll and keep aspect with D10s and uh, calculating your dice and things like that, it it's different after that. But yeah, um, definitely that's the inspiration for the for the base system. Mm-hmm. Um. Okay, I get, since you brought up L5R, I gotta ask this and judge you accordingly. Okay. What's your favorite clan, and what's your least favorite? Uh, least favorite is Crab. Uh, most favorite would be either Dragon or Crane, I'd say. So you so you pref- so you prefer the loners and the pretty boys? Got it. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> kind of you mix you mix them together. You kind of get an emo, right? Like an emo style character. That's probably me. Um, me, uh, may, maybe. Um, <laughs> I, I've used I have used Jedi jokes when it comes to when it comes to describing the dragon to people. Mm-hmm. Because that because 
everybody has everybody has their own machinations, but everybody more or less, but the dragon more or less stays out more or less stays out of it until it feels like it's necessary. Yeah. Or or some the, the the last the last character I played in L five R was a uh, a dragon. Um, so yeah. Um, usually, when I ask people for least favorite, most most people end up saying lion. Yeah, yeah, I could see that. They do have a reputation for being assholes. I mean, so so do the crab, but the crab at least have an excuse. <laughs> right. I mean, if you if you were if you were the if you had a wall separating between you and literal hell, you'd right. probably you probably would you probably wouldn't be the nicest guy in the room. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, then again, who am I to talk? Because my favorite has been the scorpion. Well, I mean, you got to backstab people for the good of the empire, right? I mean, well, I, I always liked that paradox. They're they're yeah. ba- they're backstabbers, but they're extremely loyal. Right. And well. And well, well, the last time I ended up playing one, he he wasn't the type who would backstab you. He was the type who would manipulate somebody else into front stabbing you. Uh, there you go. Because the I whenever I whenever I've played or run, I've always I've always had to beat it into people's heads. This is a game that's going to focus on the so, on the social intrigue aspects. Do mm-hmm. not go in thinking go in, go in looking for a fight. Otherwise, you're probably going to get killed. Yeah, or you'll end up insulting somebody, and they'll de- and they'll demand an EI jutsu duel. Yeah, or you just insult somebody so powerful they just tell you to commit seppuku, and you have to, <laughs> or you become a ronin, mm-hmm. or worse. You could hope you could always become a monk. Yeah, but with but with that in mind, there there is one. There is one. There is one issue that has been discussed when it comes to when it comes to roll and keep. That being that it, that it's a bit too adv- a bit more advantageous to develop att- to develop attributes instead of developing skills. Yep. I, I mean, I think I think that is uh, a valid you know statement for mm-hmm. you know um, what is more powerful in the system: attribute versus st- skills. And attributes definitely are. Um, however, you know, and I, I don't see that as a problem necessarily. Um, mm-hmm. I, I think that uh, somebody extremely strong can, if somebody's weak and very skilled, you know, you, this this strong person might still have the advantage, um, mm-hmm. you know, in arm wrestling or wrestling or whatever, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, martial arts it doesn't really matter. Um, I, so I don't see it as as a major concern now. In our system, uh, different than L5R, for instance, is um, your attributes are capped as far as how much you can increase them. Um, so if you're in a power level one game, you can only increase them up to five, for instance, and then you can't increase them anymore. Now, there's optional rules. The game has a ton of optional rules, and you can you can waive that as a GM and let them increase it as much as they like. Um, and plus, increasing uh, your attributes are much more costly than skills, and I, this is the same in L5R. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it, I, I think uh, I don't think it's really. Um, I mean, it's it's true, right? That a kept dice is more potent than a rolled dice, but I don't find it really an issue. Yeah, uh, personally. What I, I think I think one of the ways it's potentially mitigated in the, in the system that you have is. That instead instead of starting from a baseline and bu- and buying it and buying it all with points, um, you you're ro- you're rolling them the way you'd roll ability scores in more ubiquitous fantasy games. Uh, well, I mean, you can you can do a pick or roll method. Um, mm-hmm. So you can do a roll method, which um, you know. Uh, Put your attributes out there um, by random. Uh, mostly, you can you can curtail it a little bit with some uh, things at the end, which swapping attributes and then adding an attribute point uh, mm-hmm. for the roll system. But there is a there is a point by system in the core rules as well. 
and all our setting books will have uh, life path generation uh, as well. So um, that'll be added to the new things that we do, like Tetsubo, which we've licensed um, mm -hmm. uh, earlier this year. So uh, there'll be a life path with that as well. I like I like life path systems, um, even even the ones that might kill me. Look at it, you traveler. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, but let's let's um let's dive a little bit more into the whole power level thing because yeah, sure. in the in the quick start guide that's on Drive Through RPG, which I will be linking in the description for this video, um, there is there there is there is a discussion on power levels and focusing on one and two and mentioning that power level three will be in the full book. Yeah. Um, I'd like to go through the, those three in any further and to, and give me some examples of, of things, of things like books, TV shows, fit film game, what have you that yeah, sure. would fit, that would fit each power level in your mind. We'll start with power level one. Well, power, le power, power level one. Um, I would, I'm trying to think of a good example of it, but I would say um, uh, Game of Thrones. I, I would say is probably a power level one game in, in mm -hmm. a fa in a fantasy setting, kind of a um, historical fantasy setting, uh, where magic is not necessarily uh, very prevalent. Now you can make a power level one game with prevalent magic, but it's just not going to be as powerful for what you can do. Um, and the way power levels work is uh, you're you have difficulties based on the power level of the game. Um, so, for instance, a power level one game, uh, the challenging uh, target number is 14, uh, whereas in power level two, it's 21. Mm -hmm. um, so it scales with uh, you as a character, which you get more points or you get uh, to roll on a table with more favorable results um, for in character generation uh, or character creation for your attribute generation. So uh, you'll be more powerful. And the way character creation works is kind of everything cascades from what your attributes are. Um, so you'll have more skill points. You'll have more ability points when you, when you come to do those things. So you're going to be able to do more. Um, so I'd say power level one is uh, you could have like a gritty, um, a gritty, you know, um, fantasy game or a gritty, you know, historical game or hard, hard fantasy or I'm sorry, hard sci-fi or a modern, you know, uh, police drama, um, whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, power level two uh, is kind of in the middle. Um, so I, I, I think power level two is kind of what you would assume is your typical fantasy settings. Mm -hmm. um, with wizards shooting fireballs and you know i've i've ran i ran a witcher campaign with heroes and hardships and we use power level two mm -hmm. um so things like that um you, you, superhero uh you know kind of like a not street level necessarily superheroes but not like cosmic superheroes kind of like guardians of the galaxy or something like that S city scale um, superheroes yeah right yeah city city scale superheroes um Thing, things of that nature, um, sci-fi. Uh, I would say probably Star Wars is power level two, mm -hmm. um, that sort of thing. Now, power level three is. I've I've run power level three uh, when when because I, I play tested all these, uh, basically playing the game and and figuring out like what you know what theme was best for them and how to scale it all and uh, power power level three was uh, you know superhero. We did you know galactic superheroes. Um, you know that sort of thing uh, is how we how we actually did that. Any anything that's like kind of larger than life, you know, a super 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 powerful fantasy settings, um, sci-fi settings, uh, you could use for power level three. And in and in the uh, we we offer in the Kickstarter a GM's notebook where I'll have power level level four stuff in there as well. So like anything you know crazy, you want to roll. a just a bucket of dice then you know power level four is for you so. mm -hmm. um it sounds it sounds like power level three and four would easily fit a chant a chancha style game or some or some of the more some of the more got some of the more gonzo styles of fantasy the kind the kinds that wouldn't be far removed on a power metal album cover yeah they just just in anything like the I'm trying to think of like a power level three fantasy. Um, 
you know, I, I mean, so, uh, high powered Forgotten Realms, you know, if you wanted to do Heroes and Hardships and something like that. Probably Exalted. Uh, that, yeah. Yeah, maybe. Um, you know, there's probably some animes that would that would uh, um, would fit that bill. Um, yeah, that's that's also why I mentioned um, Tiansha, um, which is yeah. I'm not familiar with that, but um, are you familiar with Wusha? No. Uh, if you if you've seen if you've seen a lot of um, a lot of martial a lot of martial arts movies, you may have seen some aspects of it. But okay. Wusha is it, and I'm. I keep in mind I am vastly simplifying. But Wusha translates to martial hero, whereas Tiansha translates to immortal hero. Um, gotcha. When you get into the Tiansha levels, that's when you start to get into the really crazy stuff. The most popular example of Tiansha is um, Journey to the West. Okay. And yeah, I mean anything that like is, su- is super powerful. You want to be able to do tons of things, have tons mm-hmm. of abilities, have tons of spells or powers. If you if that's the way you're going to go, then then yeah, those power that power level three, uh, power level four will will suit the bill for sure. Yeah. Now, one thing that I found that I found kind of interesting is since you mentioned everything cascading from attributes, this means that with Attributes creating the it's an interesting idea of creating these these um separate pools because an issue an issue that I've that can happen with a lot of universal style games is is every is relying on relying on one 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 pool of resource for character creation and then tell and then p- telling players swim damn it um, yeah. Which results in a bit of choice paralysis. Res, was that something that you wanted to avoid when developing a universal system? I, I wanted to give the players as much choice as possible, but I didn't. I wanted to make sure that um, the characters made sense. Um, you know, I, I also didn't want to make it hard to play. Uh, I feel that there's some universal systems, and not naming any names, that the skills are so specific that it makes it hard to actually play at the table. Uh, not only is you know you, you have such specific skills for things, if you don't have that skill and you have to roll for it, then there's all these defaults you have to uh, look up. And mm-hmm. so I, I, I found it very unwieldy, um, th- those types of things. And I also found on the other end, there, if you're too generic, then you know, you're not able to play those kind of gritty, uh, more simulationist sort of games, right? You're stuck playing the pulpy games. Um, and and I, I wanted to make this tr- a true universal system that you could play pulp – you could play in a fashion that's super gritty, super tactical, or not. And I felt that that's where the other universal systems out there failed, is that if you picked a certain universal system, you were playing in that way, right? And that was the only way to play uh, because the system wasn't flexible enough to support really any play style. Uh, it really locked you into a certain play style, and I felt that that was where they failed. Um, and that's what this this system, I think, does better than all those, is that you can play the game truly your way. Um, you're not forced into one style of play, um, and uh, I, th- I think that's really what Heroes and Hardships does. Uh, it allows you to play the game uh, really any way you would like. Mm-hmm. Now, with that, with that in mind, when it one of the other one of the other things it, that you mentioned is is wanting to do gritty combat, um, yeah. and when I went when I went through some of the materials that I was that I was able to dig up, I wasn't able to find a a um a blank care a blank um character sheet. 
Yeah, the, I new, noticed... the new ones. Yeah, the, not the new ones. The the old ones are in the uh, quick start guide. But yeah. yeah, I was not a. I had noticed that when it came to combat, you br- you bring up um, you bring up a hit location mechanic. Yep. And something I'm curious about is how is how do you maintain that hit? Is when it comes to that hit location um, setup, um, how do you maintain that with with um mon- with monsters that obviously aren't going to have the humanoid setup. Right. So you can um one one way to do that is uh you can just default everything to torso. Um and there are some optional rules for this. Mm-hmm. Um if it's not there's some parts of the system that are not incredibly specific for Uh, Like currency, for instance, like we, I don't, there's not an actual, um, currency is highly abstracted, um, and at least in the core rule book, and that can be applied to other things as well, like hit location. Now, our hit locations that we have are very specific for humanoids, you know, two arms, two legs, and a head, and a torso, Um, but uh, if, like, for instance, if you had a tail, I would simply combine the two uh, legs for, t- you know, if it's a snake, for instance, right? Um, take that for what it is. Um, or a giant, if it was a giant plant, um, you know, you could, uh, everything as a torso, that sort of thing. And there, there's optional rules for that stuff um, to specify how you can work with uh, non-humanoid uh, body types. Mm-hmm. And the other, when it comes to when it comes to attributes, I did notice a, lo- a lot of the ones that I would expect, but also the fate attribute. Yep. And what immediately came to mind for me was the void ring and void points, and just in general the idea of a extra effort um, mechanic. Is yep. that kind of what fate is in Heroes and Hardships? Yeah, it's um, it's not necessarily void, but um, it. Uh, I mean, void. V- sure, right? Th- there are so many role playing games that have a similar concept, right? Mm-hmm. I can think of, um, you know, void is is a good one. Um, there's also uh, things like um, from uh, Dark Heresy and stuff. You would get fate points that allow mm-hmm. you to do certain things. Uh, a Song of Ice and Fire role playing game, which is uh, another one of my. Uh, favorites although it has some issues uh in Mm -hmm. my view but but uh also uh that is a mechanic and we codified it as an attribute uh to make it more uh useful to characters than just um something that get lets you do something else right Right, uh, you can spend your fate points to give yourself a benefit or uh, impact something in some other way, positive way. But also, uh, fate is our attribute that really controls magic and powers um, in a way that is absolutely necessary. Mm-hmm. Um, so, someone that is a wizard or a superhero or something uh, has to kind of balance this use of their fate. Uh, with the magic powers that they're going to use because they're very important in certain ways um, to to those systems. So, mm-hmm. And speaking of, before I get to magic, which is something I definitely want to dedicate some time to, sure. um, the other thing I noticed that I found interesting in combat is utilizing an AP system. Yeah. Was... Yeah, it- was that to provo- was that to make sure that um, there's a degree of options so that people aren't just doing um, a bunch of standard actions? Yeah, I, I think it's it's part of it. Um, it was um, so I wanted to do something different because what I find in a lot of role playing games is you get into combat and then you wait a lot, um, and I think that's where combat in a lot of games that use traditional rounds. Um, could be better and so what I came up with was not an AP system whereas on your turn you have a certain amount of APs to spend and then you can do certain actions based on those APs I, I kind of inverted it right so you have the option to do whatever you want 
but it adds APs to what we call the combat track, which is which is really where combat works. Mm-hmm. So your combat track, if you do a five AP action, let's say a charge, uh, something that takes a long time, then it pushes you down the combat track further than everyone else. So someone else can do a couple of shorter actions and have a couple of turns before you act again. So um, that combat track is very important to combat in Heroes and Hardships now. There are uh, dozens of actions, uh, offensive and defensive actions in Heroes and Hardships um, that you can do, and they have a range of AP from 1 to 5. Um, and yeah, so that combat track, you do something, you move up the combat track, that amount of APs, it allows you to act more often uh, than a round-based system, um, and it does put a lot more tactical flavor to the combat. Um, so if you're doing very long actions, like I said, you're going to wait longer. Uh, other people are going to act more more you know often but those big ap actions have uh bigger influences on the combat itself like charge or you know reckless attacking Mm -hmm. running uh that sort of thing so yeah it's just completely a different concept than most any game i've ever seen um i think it's totally innovated and unique to heroes and hardships and uh everybody who's tried it you know it takes a while to kind of understand what's happening yeah it's not around you have to pay attention to the ap costs and everybody's ap in the in the combat and after you get that boy it moves a lot quicker and you act more often and uh, everybody seems to like it so mm-hmm. the closest the net the closest comparison i could make is is the shot system that's used in feng shui and even that and even then it's not a one-to-one yeah, I've only played Feng Shui once, and I can't remember. So, um, yeah. But taking now taking that into into a, into account, um, when it one of the one L five when L five R handled um, damage, it did it on that escalating series of of penalties. Um, are you doing something similar when it comes when it comes to de- when it comes to damage where it's where it's yes. um, penal- where it's penalizing the total the more the more you get hit? Yeah, it's uh, not exa- we don't have wounds or hit points. Well, we have wounds, but we don't have anything like a, a numerical hit point system. Mm-hmm. Okay, so uh, L five R would have this. Uh, they have you know your hit points. Uh, they called it wounds, I think, um, based yeah. on your. Um, your or two rings, whatever, and calculated them. That's fine. Um, it was, and then, it and was then primarily you take, your earth ring. Yeah. And then you would take, and then you would take that down. And then if you would get some percentage below that, you would take, you know, a bigger penalty. So we don't do that. Um, what we do is we have uh, thresholds. <clears throat> one is called the wound level, and one's called injury level. And what happens is if you get hit by one strike <clears throat> and um, that strike, is surpasses your wound level you take a wound Mm -hmm. if you take a shot and it's above your injury level but not greater or equal to your wound level then you take an injury (coughs) sorry one second (coughs) ladies and gentlemen remember hail hydrate yeah um anyway so you would take um Injury or wound. Uh, injury, um, they go away after combat, but they give you a negative three per injury you get. So mm-hmm. if you do a skill check, like an attack of some sort, you're going to get a negative three uh, per injury. Mm-hmm. A wound is a little different. So a wound will um, – you roll a d10 for each wound you have. Um, it's a, called a hardship. It's where the hardship comes. Mm-hmm. From um, for each wound you have, you roll a d10. They can't explode. You add them to your difficulty. If you are uh, in a opposed check, like uh, combat <coughs> typically is, then you roll that uh, d10 or multiple d10s, and you will subtract it from your total or add it to the total of your, your uh, defender or uh, opposition, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. 
And so that's that's what a wound does. Now after combat, those wound hardships actually go away, and then you actually roll to see um, if they become not permanent, but permanent until they're healed, um, or if they they might not be healed either. Um, then mm-hmm. they would become permanent, and those are modifiers to your attributes. So uh, you basically, you, you look at how bad the wound was above your wound level, and if uh, you know the higher it is, the harder it is to roll on this table. And you don't want to roll low on those tables, um, or you can get you know your your attributes can get totally uh, nerfed. Um, and then you get certain amount of times you can try to heal that wound, and if it doesn't heal, then it just becomes a flaw, and then you lose that attribute point. Um, mm-hmm. What what whatever the, it says on the table, right? Yeah. Um, so that so that's how the wound and injury uh, system works. Um, yeah, I, I wanted to really give it some bite, um, and uh, but at the same time uh, give you a chance to. Uh, heal those wounds later on like you would normally and you can you can heal them from natural healing or you know spells or a healer or a medicine you know whatever so yeah mm-hmm. and now that that is interesting because whenever you whenever you're dealing with any sort of any sort of wound or any sort of limitation like that in a universalist system the inevitable question comes if of how you're going to maintain that if you're supposed to be dealing with people who are on the higher end of the power scale. Yep. Oh. Like if some if somebody wants to do if somebody wants to do their their Superman XP, um, mm-hmm. it's a little it's it's a little bit pushing it to to the idea that th- that they're able to do all that power yet still go down just as much as any normal human kind of defeats the point of being superhuman, you know? Well, so if you have a power level, their their wound levels are going to be much higher than mm-hmm. a power level one person. Um, they're also going to have probably abilities like this is this is a question. So I've had this question before. Can you make Superman? And I guess say yes. I say although Superman is not a beginning character, right? <laughs> right. It's like it, I I don't know why this question. I've been asked this question. Uh, a few times about power level three and it's like can you make superman it's like yeah i can make superman exactly except um i can i can make him almost exactly like superman uh with all his abilities you know all the normal abilities i know there's some weird things like yes a breath attack or something you know weird like that but uh, everything that you might think that superman has i can make that in a pl a starting pl3 character but then i also say if i want to make him like you know, be able to rotate the Earth by flying around it. He, that's not a beginning character, right? That's something you would have to spend XP on, and to get you know, a Superman that we know is not a beginning character, right? But yeah, I can do I can do all the abilities that he has in a in a starting character, and you know, uh, the the wound level stuff um, in a PL three game, sure. Uh, somebody who is extremely skilled could probably bring down Superman for a time, but um, with the abilities and stuff, it would be very difficult for that to like be like a, you know, uh, a killing blow or something. Plus, in certain games, like if you were saying, okay, we're going to play a, a superhero game where the superheroes are pretty much nigh invincible, right? At least permanently invincible they get might get KO'd you can tweak these optional rules which makes you know being being hurt permanently or being you know killed very very difficult that's why I'm saying you can play the game your way and those those optional rules you can tune them um, where you know if you wanted to play that high survivability game where nobody you know is going to be permanently killed or hurt you can do that and uh, it works just fine. Mm-hmm. So, taking that taking that into account, taking that into account, um, mm-hmm. i i like to I like to delve a little bit into magic. Sure. Uh, which is which is which is amusing in hindsight, given how I have taken the piss out of out of some out of some out of some caster players who. 
who get who get re- who get really angry if you if you take if you take away all if you take away even one of their spells. Mm-hmm. Uh, but now, in, a, in some universal games, mad magic is magic is one of is a really tricky affair because. It's because it's used as just a joke. It's used as just a joker for about for any other existing abil- any other existing ability. Um, Mutants and masterminds immediately comes to mind. Is it is it pulled that exact sa- that exact kind of stunt? Um, but from what from, from what I'm from what I'm seeing, you you are you are using magic to be bo- to be both the traditional casting magic as well as su- as well as certain forms of superpowers. Yep. Um what brought you to that conclusion? Cuz I'm guessing you had the same issue with magic in universal games as I did. Yeah, so <clears throat> I wanted the two flavors to be different. Um one one of the things about Heroes and Hardships is it allows you to uh, I want I want you to be able to <clears throat> play uh, magic as a, uh, a feel like a sorcerer, okay? Mm-hmm. And I want the feel of a superhero or an innate magical power you have to be different. <clears throat> and that's why it's designed this way. Um, so there are technically two types of magic systems, although they're almost identical, but the changes are are so important for each and a sorcerer or a wizard when we talk about a traditional magic user you know throwing fireballs and and whatnot um when they cast spells um they take a manifestation our spells like in other books are called manifestations okay and spells are actually the uh what the actual wizard cast that's 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 if i say a spell versus a power right um, so these manifestations, each of them have uh, a certain um, category. So, for instance, it has its potency. It's basically what it does. It has duration, targets, um, <clears throat> you know, a distance, things like that. Um, and so, certain manifestations allow those to be altered. Um, so a duration you can make it uh, five minutes or ten minutes or fifteen, minutes, whatever. Um, or you know, in combat, you can make it you know five AP or ten AP, or the person's next next turn, next two turns. What, how, however, the it, it's specific to the manifestation itself. So in a wizard, uh, so in traditional magic, those things can be enhanced uh, as much as you possibly want uh, for those categories. Um, and what will? Okay, great. Why wouldn't I do that all the time? Because it increases the difficulty of the spell. Mm-hmm. Um, and it increases it uh, a a penalty dice or a hardship uh, per one you use. Uh, so by by default, it's always level one. So for every level that you increase that increase that spell, it's a uh, another hardship. So if I want to do a level five spell, um, it's going to be five hardships on my roll. Mm-hmm. Okay. And uh, mo- most, uh, you know, most spells can't be actively defended. It's against their magic defense and whatever your difficulty that you've pumped into the spell is. And then if we and and if we look at pow- powers instead of traditional magic, it's very different. Powers you cannot ad hoc change change the manifestation you have. You have to buy them. Mm-hmm. So if you purchased the power with all these upgrades that's cool you can do those um but you can't do anything else higher you could go lower you know you, if you if, if you know you needed to touch somebody instead of you know doing it five away or whatever but though those actually do not uh require any um upgrades so there's no like uh increase in difficulty you don't you don't actually roll what's called spell dice uh instead it's usually actively defended um, mm-hmm. if you're targeting someone, and then a spell or a power if they're not actively defending is a is a uh, is challenging. So uh, a challenging difficulty. So that's how they both work. And then there's subtle differences in um, how dangerous they are because we have like uh, what you would call as a, a fumble 
uh, they're called surges in the system. So mm-hmm. it's easier to surge and have a fumble in the magic system versus the power system, for instance. Mm-hmm. So that's that's the main differences in the two. Um, and I, I thought that you know uh, with without making an entire different magic system, which people do. Um, for different types of, of uh, magics, I was going to just barely change them in certain ways that gave the feel for either powers or magic. So. Mm-hmm. Now, with, with, that in, with that in mind, since you mentioned surges, um, how yeah. would that be triggered with a, with a die roll? Yep, so a surge can be triggered. Uh, traditional magic can, can do it t- two ways. Um, so this goes back to your fate attribute. Uh, your fate attribute is, uh, besides giving you bonuses to things when you spend or burn, permanently losing them, um, uh, it does a couple of things. Number one, uh, it it limits how many powers or spells you can have. Um, so it does that. Uh, it also, uh, more importantly probably, is when you make a die roll um, and you are trying to channel all your energy into your casting if you have more dice that explode than your fate score then you surge Mm -hmm. that's one way to surge so you're pumping too much energy into whatever this is okay that's that works for both powers and magic Mm -hmm. and then also on magic if you rolled your difficulty dice your spell dice which is uh, hardship dice, and if more of those explode than your focus, you also surge, and then you use whichever's worse. Mm-hmm. But um, if, if you would surge on both rolls, for instance, um, so that's that's how the surging works. And then you you check like, and then and then you there's only one skill under fate, and it's called focus. Mm-hmm. And then you make a focus roll to see if you can kind of control what you're doing. And if you can, then you don't surge. You, you've cut off the surge. But if you fail that roll, then you see how bad you failed, and then you roll on a table uh, mm-hmm. based on that failure. It, it works exactly like wounds So yeah. um, in, that, in that regard. So you, you'll notice that a lot of the systems kind of mimic each other, so you don't have to learn all these uh, you know, different systems for different things, like completely unconnected. And so you, you learn just a, like three or four different systems, and then you get the whole, you get the whole thing. Right, mm-hmm. everything's going to be real, real familiar. So, yeah, yeah. Now, in some in some games, um, being able being able to utilize magic requires some sort of uh, some sort of advantage or the like buy in. Yep. Is that is that the case with Heroes and Hardships or <laughs> not? It is. It it is in most situations. So, uh, for powers, it, it definitely is. So in powers, you can get it two different ways. You can get it through ancestry traits. Mm-hmm. So ancestry traits are how we do our races, ancestries, species, whatever, uh, you get ancestry traits that give you unique things you can do. So one of them is you get powers. Okay. And it, it it's a different way to get a power than actually having, the superpowers ability okay so you can take the superpowers ability then you can buy your powers okay that all takes ability points on traditional magic you can do the same thing you take uh, a magic user and then you can buy your spells there's one way to cast magic without an ability and that is to use the arcane uh arcana uh skill and the arcana skill um allows you to cast any spell that you can find or know from a written source. So if you think of an academic wizard, um, they can use this arcana skill uh, Mm -hmm. instead of buying superpowers. The problem is you cast everything at a hardship. You take one hardship immediately to all your all your roles mm-hmm. um so there is one way to get around that but it's 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 for it's supposed to be used for academics that study spell books right they don't have any inherent magical abilities necessarily but or like you're playing a, a cthulhu you know lovecraftian game and you find like a uh, the Necromonicon or whatever, and you know you read that book, and so so you have some arcana 
thing instead of actually being a wizard, right? So that's that's kind of uh, the way that works, yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, with that with that in with that in mind, um, when it do you plan on do you plan on putting in a a segment to get to your advice if um if if a, if if players want to create their own magic system that that, that doesn't yeah. quite fit within traditional magic, for instance. Yeah. So um, there, there there are plans for other books. Um, the core book, uh, I, I kept it not huge on purpose. Mm-hmm. Um, it's uh, 248 pages, and um, there there will be things that come down the pike uh, that adds magic, uh, different kinds of magic. Uh, like we have eight different types of magic in the game uh, currently. The, those are the spe- the manifestation types. They all kind of have a theme. Um, you know, nature, soul. Uh, you know that sort of thing um, and uh, so there'll be other things out there I already have several finished um, it's just to put them in the you know in future um, books either where, wherever they fit best really mm-hmm. um, but in and, and that GM's that GM's uh, notebook will have some advice for that as well um, so there will be other GM kind of supplements that can that can show you, hey, how might you make a spell, right? That you think will work, um, that sort of thing. So yeah, there, there's going to be advice for that stuff, but in the core rule book, not so, not so much for that. Mm-hmm. Now, with that with that in mind, when it comes to now when it comes to advancement, obviously you're going with a XP based approach. I'm guessing that. Yep. The approach we're doing here is um, XP as currency. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, b- basically that's right. Uh, your XP, um, each thing that you can upgrade or get costs a certain amount of XP. Um, how you mm. how you, has a GM how you give out, out out XP is up to you. I don't have like, you know, this monster gives you this much XP. There's none of that stuff. It's uh, you know, I, I the way I do things in my games is I give out XP for uh, completing tasks. You know, mm-hmm. if that includes killing some things, great. If it doesn't, that's also great. Um, so uh, you know, we do a lot of role play in my games. So you know, everybody is going to role play well. So you know, if, if they do something incredible in game, they might get more XP. I don't know. It doesn't matter. It's up to the GM, right? But the way that it's spent, you know, um, skills have a certain cost, attributes have a certain cost, abilities have a certain cost, and that's really it. Mm-hmm. Now. Within the within the book, do you plan do you plan on putting in a few not not fully detailed, but ju- but just sa- but just sample se- just sample settings that a GM could build could build around? There is there is not in the core rule book. No, um, I wanted to keep it as you know completely universal with no um, no leads to any settings whatsoever. Um, we do have a lot of settings. Uh, that, that will be released next year. Um, I might have mentioned it. The Tetsubo setting will be mm-hmm. uh, coming to Kickstarter with. This was a setting uh, created um, for the original um, Warhammer Fantasy uh, as their Asian-inspired setting. It didn't get end up getting made, and so the authors uh, bought back the rights. They still have them to this day, and I have licensed it, so we will be doing Tetsubo next year, mm-hmm. um, and it will be... Um, it will be our first big setting. Um, I, like I, I released a uh, adventure on the lead up to our Kickstarter that has uh, setting uh, hooks for people. It's called Mummy Dust. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's out there. It's free, uh, and uh, it's like uh, more like a, you know a, a Eastern European um, setting. Um, maybe it's fantasy. Maybe it's not. It's up to you. Uh, basically, during the um, Black Plague. Um, so it's kind of mm-hmm. like that and we'll do things like that too. I'll have micro settings, which might be 50 pages of a setting. And then just, you know, it's very small or loosely. Uh, I have this other line. Uh, I have, I have a lot of plans. Okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> There's this line of, uh, adventures that are going to be kind of self-contained, but in the same setting, 
Um, that, that's a sci-fi setting. And uh, mm-hmm. so, yeah, there'll be there'll be things like that, but not not in the core rule book. The core rule book is just rules. Yeah. And within the sample, I saw I saw that you also have a, a segment dedicated to vehicles. So, yep. how similar and di- how similar and different is vehicle creation to put to player character creation? Um, it's not too different. Um, it's uh, so obviously vehicles don't have skills in themselves. So mm-hmm. um, everything is the same except um, you know your derived characteristics are different. <coughs> it's not the same thing. <coughs> Sorry, but there are other. Um, your abilities are like things that are in the vehicle, like, um, you know, automatic countermeasures for attacks and that sort of thing. So. Mm -hmm. And I'm getting, I'm guessing that vehicles apply that I'm guessing that when it comes to scale, the scale of vehicles, we're going in anywhere from personal conveyance to full on ships. Yeah. They, they have a size and like everything has a size rating and, um, it's not like, I wouldn't say like there's a specific hey size one is you know six feet tall and size two is twelve. No, it doesn't. It's 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 a little bit like a little bit more generic than that. But yeah, so and you have rules like hey a size one person can't fit on a size one vehicle or something like that, right? Mm-hmm. Um, or a size two person can't sit in the size two vehicle. And then um, yeah, but yes, they they do have different sizes and. Like the size, the the cool thing is that the sizes in um, personal combat, you know, how size differences work, work the same way in vehicles. If you get a size two vehicle and a size three vehicle, it works the same way. Mm -hmm. And do you have plans for for how um, for how combat with vehicles is going to work? Uh, how, how personal combat with vehicles works? Is that what you asked, or just vehicle combat? Just vehicle combat and oh, yeah. possibly chases. Yep, it's it's in there. Um, so vehicle combat works. Um, so vehicle combat. There's a whole vehicle combat system in here. It works just like uh, normal combat with just different actions. Um, yeah, there's no difference. Um, and uh, chases. Uh, that is an extended task, which is. Uh, you know, in the in the very first chapter of the book, um, so. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And what are you shooting for as far as the total page count for the entirety of the book? Oh, the 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 entirety book is is finished. Uh, it's two hundred forty eight pages, um, and that's that's going to be it for the core rule book. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. It is. Uh, it is. <clears throat> Our Kickstarter campaign. Uh, it's it's got twenty four twenty five days left. Um, and once uh, once Kickstarter sends the funds, uh, everybody who is backed, and uh, they will get a almost completely finished uh, copy of the PDF. Mm-hmm. Um, it's early access version. The only thing is there's a couple uh, art, art spots that aren't finished, uh, and uh, they'll get everything else. So uh, they'll be able to play right away. Uh, we have a character sheet on Roll20. Mm-hmm. Um It'll come with the character, you know, the pen and paper character sheets. There's a form. There'll be a form fillable PDF. Um, so, yeah, it's uh, everything will be available. Although, speaking of that, since you mentioned Roll Twenty, do you have plans yeah. on on uh, Are you researching ways to automate the mm-hmm. um, the AP system? Well, I ha- I have macros that do it, mm-hmm. um, which I'm I am happy to give those macros to everybody after once the campaign's done. I'm going to put those macros on our website. They can be downloaded, mm-hmm. so anybody that's a little savvy in how Rule Twenty works, they can easily set that up. Um, I also uh, am not against like having a um, like a template character in Roll Twenty Character Vault, and I can just give it to people. I don't know how busy that would make me, but you know, something like that. Because mm-hmm. um, the AP system is actually not not too hard, uh, it, it, especially in Roll Twenty. It's all really quite a breeze. Um, so I have macros that can do that, and people uh, that want those, I'm happy to give them to them, uh, and they can use them. Mm-hmm. And I I will certainly be looking forward to seeing how, seeing how it develops, and I'm. Especially hoping that that some of the um, stretch goals that are on the that are on the page itself get met, since we got yep. 
We got 24 days to go. Congratulations on getting funded in about five hours, by the way. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, I, th I think we have a, a good shot of getting most of them. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you, the Kickstarter has the lull in the middle, the long, everybody knows about it, right? It's just, you know, you just have to be patient. And that last, you know, three or four days, um, you know, uh, I, th I think we have a, I think we have a chance to get them all. Um, I do. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, and if we, if something happens where we really start burning through them and, you know, I have ideas for more, so, um, it won't, it won't be a problem if we need, uh, another, uh, you know, another stretch bowl or two. So mm -hmm. I'm happy, I'm happy to give people, uh, their money's worth for sure in this. And uh, that's what really one of the one things I wanted to do in this, in this, uh, Kickstarter is give people their money's worth without, you know, uh, bankrupting myself. But, um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think we can get through these stretch goals if uh, if um, people uh, you know tune in. We have a lot of a lot of followers that have hit the hit the page more than we did before. Like I think we started with like a uh, twelve forty or something like that, and now we have almost two thousand followers. So um, a lot of those people are just watching, and I assume we you know when we get closer and we get that forty eight hour notice. You're gonna see a, you're gonna see something like the first two days that we had. So, mm -hmm. and I will be certainly looking forward to it. But with all of that said, I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens around here. <laughs> well, I am I am uh, more than happy to do so, and I uh, appreciate you pledging and uh, actually. Um, letting me come on here and talk about this game for a while. Mm -hmm. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> and right, well, thank you. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that came from as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody!